as I reflected on this, uh, this text from 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 9 to 20, only three words came to me as a subject, if I should use one tonight. And it is that he will also. And there are many things that God does. And as I read this passage in preparing for this word tonight, then in the same chapter, he shows up himself again as a God who will also. Now, what I noticed in this, um, this week as well is that and I've said it before that oftentimes I don't always know when it feels like the Lord is taking me through a series. Sometimes it's very clear. And sometimes I don't know till when it gets to the second week, I'm like, wait, we just talked about this kind of thing last week, Lord. Why are you bringing me back into this? But I do think that before our anniversary service, this coming month and by the way, February 25th, we celebrate the second anniversary. I believe that the Lord is leading us. He's leading me. And because he's leading me, I bring it here. So he's leading us through the Valley series, the Valley series. I believe personally that there are Valley versions, the same way we read the scriptures from different versions, because we each have our particular form of Valley experiences. And I think of them as the Valley version series. I think of the different kinds of valleys each person um, goes through. And last week we looked at Ezekiel's valley. And this week we have three kings, including Jehoshaphat. And uh, we also have Jehoram, who some versions call him Joram. He was the son of Ahab. And you remember Ahab was the king of Israel and, and Jezebel was, was his wife. So, um, there's Jehoshaphat, there's Joram, and they met up with the king of Edom, and so those three kings. So after um, Ahab died, Joram, his son, Jehoram, in some versions, uh, became king over Israel. And so this guy, Misha, Misha was the, um, the king of Moab. He was a sheep master. Well, he raised sheep. And somehow, in this history of Ahab reigning as king over Israel, Misha, the king of Moab, was forced to give the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and 100,000 rams. So when Ahab died, he rebelled. So the son Jehoram decided that if you're going to rebel, you're not paying any more than 100,000 lambs and the 100,000 rams, then this calls for war. So he prepared Israel for war. And that's how he sought help from Jehoshaphat, who was the king at that time over Judah. Now, that was during the time when both um, Israel and Judah had split and one was the northern kingdom, that was Israel, and, and Judah was the southern kingdom. So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah um, at that time, and Joram was king over Israel. And so if you follow me into this text, it's an interesting story that it was Jehoram's, and I'll interchange that name, maybe Joram is easier to call him. It was his request to Jehoshaphat to help him. He said, the king of Moab, has come up against me. He has rebelled against me. Would you join me in fighting against him? And of course, Jehoshaphat said, of course, my troops are your troops. My horses, your horses. We are one. And here's the question that Jehoshaphat asked him, which route shall we take? Well, where do you want us to go? Which way shall we go? Now, as we look at this valley experience here tonight, Understand that Jehoshaphat's help was sought and Jehoshaphat consented to the help, but he didn't know what route this guy was going to take. He didn't know what Joram was going to do. He didn't know where he wanted to go uh, with this. And so what he did in that moment, he said to him, 
I am here to help you. Which route do you want to go? Where do you want us to go with this? Where are you going to go uh, to, to attack uh, Moab with this in this battle? So I want us to consider the way that Joram took. Joram answered Jehoshaphat and he said, let us go through the way of the wilderness, through the wilderness of Edom. So it was through that wilderness that the king of Edom joined them. And that's how two kings became three against the fight uh, with the Moabites. But understand something, when we look at this choice of the way, this journey was chosen by Joram. This path was chosen by this guy to go towards his battle. Now, last week, we looked at a path where they entered in the valley. They entered in a bad, in what is considered bad lands where Ezekiel went, but it was God who took Ezekiel. It was the spirit of the Lord that took Ezekiel. Now, isn't that something? That sometimes we find ourselves in a journey or on the journey that the spirit of the Lord took us on, like Ezekiel. And sometimes the journey we are on, we choose it for ourselves. Hmm. So some valleys are places where the Lord brings you himself for a purpose, for a reason, for what he's doing in you. And sometimes the valleys we find ourselves in are the valleys we chose for ourselves and the valleys that we followed other people into. Jehoshaphat, followed Joram into the valley of Edom. And through this wilderness, the message translation calls it badlands. The King James refers to it as valley. As they went through the wilderness, what was clear was that this was not a place that had anything flourishing and life and anything to be beautiful and or to beautify the place. This was a battle they were entering into in a valley, in a wilderness experience. But there was something about this experience. The text describes it that as they went around this wilderness, in this valley, it was like a looping detour. One version says they went round about. So you find yourself in a place where your detour into this place is like a loop. I'm sure we remember that. You remember the, the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, a whole loop. You're detouring through here so you wouldn't go through the land of the Philistines and God took them through this loop. Have you ever gone on a detour thinking that, okay, the construction is over here and I'm going to go through this place because that's where the signs say, or maybe, maybe you chose that detour, but you end up on the same main track as if you had gone in the badlands. Just a week ago, when I travel out to my nine to five job out in Etobicoke, it can be a very long and distressing travel in the mornings. An hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half, hour on a good day, an hour on a good day. And I remember one morning as I entered the address in, because I do it every morning, so, so the Waze app would help me to find where the traffic is and and what I could, which, which route I could take. Because sometimes if I don't do that before I get to the end of that ramp, I would have missed my opportunity to take a detour for a shorter route to, to avoid some of the traffic. And a lot of that traffic is on the Skyway. So it might not make any sense to you if you, because you might not have any idea where I'm at, but the Skyway is the tall bridge that comes across uh, the lake and, it gets windy and it's trafficy, and sometimes it's just trafficy for no reason. No wind, no, no accident, nothing. It, it's, it's just what happens on the QEW. And so that morning, as I entered the, the, the address for work in, which is standard, and I clicked it, I noticed it said that I should take uh, this particular exit just before I get to the ramp for the highway. So I was like, okay. That means there's heavy traffic on the Skyway. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take it. I'm going to follow the Waze app. 
Great recommendation. I love it. Always use it for that purpose. But it did tell me that I should turn off at a certain road, a boulevard, beach boulevard that's kind of halfway through what I am used to doing. Now, this road runs parallel to the Skyway. So I'm going nicely. There's one other vehicle on this road. I'm seeing the Skyway jammed up with traffic. And I pass the, the, the boulevard that I should take because I don't want to turn off there yet. I don't want to go onto the Skyway and sit in that parking lot yet. I want to go down further where I thought I could exit. And I did just what I wanted to do. I chose the path I wanted to take. When I got down there, the lift bridge was closed, that area, and there was only one detour. I detoured right back. All of losing seven minutes of drive to go right back to the one way I could get to the highway and it was to take that boulevard I should have taken. A looping detour. But the road was attractive. It was clear. There was nobody in my way, nothing. I just wanted to seize the opportunity because this route looked good. But it was a detour, and it wasn't just any detour. It's a looping detour. It's a roundabout detour that takes you right back to the very main track that you should have been on in the first place. Why am I sharing that story? What I learned that morning was that if I had followed the instruction from my GPS, I wouldn't have lost seven minutes. Going on an empty road, feeling great but it was going nowhere because it was looping me right back. Every traffic, everything that went there had to turn the very route I turned back to, to the boulevard. And it was frustrating, disappointing. It was hard and I thought, should have known. What, why was I just one of two vehicles? And as a matter of fact, the other vehicle that I just passed like a breeze. I mean, the guy turned off somewhere because at one point I looked up in my rear view and I was the only vehicle and it felt great. I didn't know what was waiting for me on the path I chose. I chose that path. And sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness experiences in a looping detour, just going around and coming back to the same path. Problems in our lives that we keep coming back to, the same problem. Problems in our lives that won't go away, the same problems. Problems in our lives that if you had made that decision five years ago, 10 years ago, even two months ago, you wouldn't have been back there today. That decision, a looping detour, those are frustrating. It's not just a detour that avoids some kind of, um, you know, obstacle or construction or whatever is in the way. And it takes you a little ahead, maybe longer, but it's ahead. The looping detours are the ones that take you here and there and you feel like you're getting out, but you come right back to where you started. And that is hard. And that's what these three kings found themselves into. You start a journey with great hopes, thinking you would go further, but you didn't prepare for the valleys that came along the way. And so they decided to go into battle. But in this, they didn't realize that after seven days of this looping detour, they would run out of water. It wasn't just water for their animals. They ran out of water for the army and for their animals. Wow. Wow. Some of the things, some of the path we take and some of the things we take on those journeys, some of the journeys we choose for ourselves, we don't think ahead. We don't plan carefully ahead. And it leads us into a lot of frustration and negativity and we start to spiral. I tell you that morning, I could beat myself. I said, if I had sat in that parking lot traffic by taking the boulevard I should have taken, I would have been seven minutes ahead, but I chose a road that seemed right. 
it seemed right. And it was frustrating. And I started to spiral in the negative. I'm going to miss my early meeting. I'm not going to make it for this. Oh my God, why, why wasn't I thinking? I should have recognized it. If there were not many vehicles on this road, why do I think I'm the only one who would have gotten this? And so the blame game. That was exactly what the king of Israel did. Started a blame game. When they got stuck after seven days with no water and the loop was not ending and there was no battle, like it wasn't happening yet. He said, it's the Lord who called us out to dump us, to dump all three kings of us into the hands of the enemy. The same guy. Is that familiar? Is that familiar for some of us? It's that familiar. When we were growing up, my mother always said, and I know she's online, anything you use your hand by, you call it your own. There are some things that we cause on ourselves, but it's hard to take that blame. And sometimes we end up like the Jehoshaphats in a, in a circumstance where you're trying to help someone. But in helping that person, you bring yourself in a place where you get into a looping detour that you didn't bring on yourself, but you followed someone into that situation. And sometimes that happens to us too. You follow people into some problem things. And the same king that chose the journey, the same king that chose this path was the first one to start the blame game. He said it was the Lord who called us to go, to dump us to go basically and just hand us over into the hands of the enemy. But you know what's important? It, and I love this because in the moment, Jehoshaphat could have blamed him and said, oh, weren't you thinking ahead? Why would you have chosen this path to bring us here? So we run out of water seven days, water for men, water for our animals. But he didn't. Jehoshaphat was like, there's a way out. Wait, wait, wait. Pause long enough to wonder. He said, isn't there a prophet of God anywhere around here who we can consult? I want you to know that even in the looping detours, even in the situations we buy for ourselves and call on ourselves, even in some of the journeys that we took upon ourselves, can't blame anybody else. Because you use your hand to buy this. This was your doing. Can't blame this on anybody else. But even when we find ourselves in our own messes, isn't it just beautiful that there is a way out because we can consult God? Wow. And it got me to thinking that. So last week, we saw God's spirit, the spirit of the Lord taking Ezekiel into the valley. And this week, these kings chose the valley. Yet he also, he also gave them a way out. Isn't that just such a comforting place to find yourself? Isn't that just beautiful reflection of the grace of almighty God? That when your frustrations hit you from your own boo-boos and mess ups and mistakes and, and tough situations in life. When we make the wrong turn ourselves, that, that when we chose some things that were not good for us on our own because we refused to hear the word of God, that when we moved ahead in our own strength and choose things that were not good for us, that God still makes a way out and a provision for a way out. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah said, are you kidding me? Is there not a prophet in this place? Anywhere around here that we can consult God about? And one of the servants from the kings of Israel, the same Joram, who chose this path, who drew Jehoshaphat into his problem, who took along the king of Edom into his problem, the same one, his servant said, 
there is Elisha. Wow. That's, that's all. There's Elisha, a man who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. I mean, he was really Elijah's right-hand man. He was a servant to the prophet of God. And can you imagine that this was the only resume? Wow. That came for Elisha. What a resume. What a resume. There is one here. There's one around here. His name is Elisha, son of Shaphat. And he used to pour water on Elijah's hand. That did not need a definition because everyone knew who Elijah was. And if there was a man who had any, oh, glory to God Almighty. If there was a man who had any connection to Elijah, then he came with stuff. There was something about him. And I know that you may not have big degrees on your resume, and maybe you do, but your resume, like Elisha, I know a man who has a connection to a man, to a source, to Almighty God, and that's the only resume. That's the only experience and qualification for your resume. I wonder what's on your resume. I wonder somebody listening tonight, what would be said about you? What is on your resume? How would you be? <laughs> defined. What is your resume? There is one here. When Jehoshaphat heard the name, Jehoshaphat said, here is a man of God that we can trust. Good, it's a man that we can trust. Is there a man here? Yes, he's Elisha. He used to pour water in Elijah's hand. Well, there goes a godly man that we can trust his word. And we wonder why Eli, why Jehoshaphat would say that of Elisha. But when you think about what the word of God says in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22, the Lord confirmed that when he speaks, when a prophet speaks, you know a prophet who is true or false because when he speaks, if it doesn't come to pass, then it was not God who spoke it. And so Jehoshaphat knew that Elijah had a reputation and therefore Elisha has this reputation. And so they went down to see Elisha, all three of them. Remember, this is the way out. They are finding a way out of the way that they carried themselves through. And when they went to see Elisha, I love this, Elisha saw the king of Israel, Joram, and he addressed him. What do you and I have in common? What exactly do you and I have in common that I should even be in your presence right now? There's some people we don't want to cr cross path with. There's some people we don't want to cross the same bridge with. There's some people that you, they have a reputation that you don't want to be anywhere near them. There are some people that they have a history that because of your resume, you don't want to be connected with them. There's some people that are not good for your character. And there are some people that despite your stance and status in Almighty God, they create a trigger in you. Oh, okay. They create a trigger in me. Because, you know, I want to understand that not many of us, not all of us, are triggered by some people. Not all of us are triggered by some people who really rub you the wrong way. And, and when, I, when you look at the text, you realize that Elisha might have been carrying some feelings for this king for a while. He had a word for him for a long time. Like some of us have a word or two for some people for a long time. 
you know, one sister, I remember in her testimony one night, she said, Pastor, to, not to me, we were in church. She said, Pastor, I, I just want to tell him words of God, only two, only just two, two words of God. And that's when you know how triggered this sister was by whoever this person she wanted to tell, just two words of God. Triggered. Elisha was so triggered by seeing the king of Israel. He said to him, why don't you go and consult those puppet prophets that, that, that your father and your mother served, the, the Baal gods, the, your Beelzebub. The, why don't you go and, 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 and consult them? What are you doing here? Do you know anything about our God? Because you see, Joram was terrible. The scripture says that Ahab was worse. He was a little bit better than his father Ahab, but he was still as disgusting as Nabal, who was the one that they, they, they built all kinds of worship and caused Israel to sin against Almighty God. And though Joram tore down the Baal temples that his father built, he still led Israel away from Almighty God. And so he wasn't very different. He was just a little bit better than his father. But he also led Israel to sin. And Elisha, the man of God, could not stand what he was doing to Israel. And he had a word or two for him. And it seemed it was a long time coming. But you know what this story reveals to me here? That even though you hold grudges against some people, who've hurt you, even though there are people who've triggered you. My God in heaven, some people rub you the wrong way. Some people, it seems, capitalize on who you are because they know your faith. They know your testimony. They know you're not going to give them any bad words. They know you're not going to swear at them. They know that you're not going to say anything evil. Doesn't mean that you're not thinking it. And they use it to to just needle you and, and trigger and cause you to develop some revengeful thoughts sometimes in you. And Joram was like that for Elisha. Elisha said, you come to me while, while your mother and father have these puppet prophets, that they false prophets, that they've led God's people away from him. What are you doing here coming to me? But despite that kind of hurt, Despite that pain, there's a beautiful example of how the man of God addressed this. When, when Joram rege, uh, rebuked in his, in his rebuttal, he said, ah, this is not me. It's your God who's gotten us into this. And I'm thinking, God, when did God get you into this? You decided you wanted to go fight against Moab. You decided you were going to seek help from other people. You decided to go through this valley. And know that you're in problems and you run out of water and you're spiraling in negativity and you blame the whole world and everybody's at fault for the mess you caused on yourself. Then he's also telling the prophet of God, it is your God who caused this. But here, Elijah's response, that just, oh my God. He says, as God lives, the God before whom I stand ready to serve. You hear what I'm saying? As God lives, the God before whom I stand ready to serve. You're not doing this for them. You hear me, somebody? You're not doing it because of them. You're not doing it because of them. You are doing it because of the God, the God of heaven's army, the God almighty who's called you, the God who saved you, the God who's kept you, the God who preserved you from their evil words and their evil devices and their evil wickedness against you. It is before that God you stand and before that God that you are serving. And he says, before the God I stand ready to serve. If it weren't for the respect 
of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, because I know a man who's come out of praise. I know somebody who has a different reputation. I know the person that is beside you. Hear me, somebody. Some of those people who are carried down artists drag you down into all kinds of things. These people are just aligned to some good people. Good people, you know, people in whom the power and the spirit of Almighty God is. They are connected to some people with a praise within them. And Elijah said, because of the respect I had for Jehoshaphat, a man of Judah, a man of praise, this is the only reason I'm giving you time of day. Hear me, somebody. Your service to God takes precedence. Your service to God takes precedence over your feelings about them. I want somebody to get that again. Your service to Almighty God takes precedence over your feelings about them. Elisha said, the God before whom I stand ready to serve, to serve the hypocrite, to serve the one who gossip about me, to serve those who ostracize me, to serve those who rebuke me, to serve those who criticize and tear down, to serve those who hate and abuse, to the ones before whom I have been crucified because I stand before Almighty God. I will put my feelings aside because my service to God takes precedence over my feelings. So he said, because of that, get me a, a minstrel, get me a musician, get me a musician. Hear me somebody. You know, it, it is no wonder or, or services, churches all over the world. Well, why do you think we begin worship with music, with singing, with praise? Because there needs to be an atmosphere of worship that brings you into a place, especially after you are so triggered. Some people will trigger you. Your children will trigger you. Your spouse will trigger you. Some colleagues will trigger you. Some devil from hell people in the world will trigger you. But you have a duty to, to Almighty God, the God before whom Elisha says, I stand ready to serve. Can you serve even when you're triggered? Can you serve even when everything inside of you is, is turning over? Can you serve even when it six your stomach? Can you serve? Even when they've brought you to some low places, can you serve because of your commitment to Almighty God? He says, bring a musician because I need to get into a place to know that he did not create me for fear. He did not create me for this anger. He did not create me for this kind of revenge I want in you. He did not create me to worry about you. He did not create me for anything else but to trust him. Bring me a musician. Bring me into worship. Hear me somebody when the enemy brings you down because of whomever he has in your life or brings in your life and the things in your house and the things just outside your house, the things in your workplace and the things just outside your workplace, the things in the park parking lot, the things at the grocery store, the things in which you have to come across. Hear me, somebody, find yourself in an atmosphere of worship when the musician played. Because you see, Elisha's anointing came after worship, after music. Yeah, for many of us, we know what that is. When there's a song that brings you into that place, now that he's in the room, Know that he's in the room. Know that he's in the room. I, I don't have to see your trigger. Know that he's in the room. I don't have to see your puppet faking face. Know that he's in the room. I no longer hear all the ostracism. Know that he's in the room. I don't even have to live with your sarcasm. Know that he's in the room. Elisha was charged up. And the text says that as the musician played, the anointing, the power of God came. 
upon the servant of God and hear what he said. He said, dig dishes, ditches, dig some wells around this valley, dig some wells all over this valley, dig some wells right here because something's about to happen. God's going to do something here. Dig ditches all over this valley, the very valley that you put yourself into, even though you brought yourself there. God has a word for you in this room tonight. Even though the mistake was on you, even though you brought yourself into your own valley of Edom, Almighty God says to tell you, dig some ditches around this valley you have created for yourself. Oh God Almighty, hear Elisha, you, will, you, will, you won't know what happened. You will not hear the wind. You won't even see the rain. But this valley is going to be filled up with water, the same valley. But I love the King James Version. I love the expression in the text we read tonight. He says in verses 16 and verse 17 as well, make this valley full of ditches. For the Lord says to you, neither shall you hear the wind. Even when I can't hear him, he's working. Neither shall you see the rain. Even when I can't see it, he's working yet. That valley shall be filled with water. You know why this is important to me? Because the text says, make this valley full. And then he says, that valley shall be filled with water. God can take your this and turn it into your that. He's the God who is also. He can take your this and he turns it into that. Look what God can do with your this. I know this is your this. I know this is a valley. I know this is a dry season. I know everything around you is tough. I know. This is the place you don't want to be. I know this is the season in which you don't want to rejoice. You can't rejoice. You don't feel a rejoicing. I know this is the pain. I know this is the hurt. I know this is a season where you feel God has left you, but he can turn your this into that full of water running over. Oh God Almighty, he says that there shall spring up in you a well of living water. That's what I want to give you. That's what I want to move your this to. I want to make it your that. This valley full of ditches. For the Lord says he shall turn it into that full of water. But hear me, I'm, I'm going to wrap up, but, but there's something here that when he said that, you would think that this was the only valley. Oh my God, you won't hear it. You won't see it, but it will fill up. You hear me, somebody, you can't see it. You didn't even hear when it's coming to you, but it will fill up because God is a God of suddenly and it comes to you suddenly because he turns this into that suddenly in the twinkling of an eye. And hear me, somebody, the word continues to say that even though they won't hear it, it will happen and the water will be for your army and it will be for your animals and they will drink to their fill. Everything that's attached to you, everything that is attached to you, your puss, your dog, your farm, everything that is attached to you. He said, when I turn your this into your that, they will have enough to drink. Your children, your spouse, your business, your work, your job. Oh God Almighty, everything, your crop, your season will be filled with water. And then this, and then this, the prophet said to them, this is a simple matter. You hear me, somebody. I know for you it is hard. It is impossible. It is insurmountable. It is unclimbable. It, it, it seems it cannot be reached. But this is a simple matter for God. I don't know who doesn't want to shout in this place tonight. It's a light thing for God. It's an easy thing for your God. When your ditches are turned into ditches filled with water, for you it is hard. But it's a simple matter. I guess I should have just titled the sermon that. It's a simple matter. It's a simple matter. For your big God, a simple matter. 
It is easy. He can do that too. I don't know what your struggle is in the space tonight, but he can do that too. I don't know what your crisis is, but he can do that too. I don't know what breakthrough you need, but he can do that too because it is a simple matter for God. And then you thought the blessings were over. Okay, we're getting this ditch, turning into that ditch, overflowing with water because it's a simple matter. And then the prophet added this. He will also, he will also. God is a God of abundance. God is a God of overflow. He will also hand over your enemies to you. He will also. He will also. He will also. I don't know if it is the money that is your ditch and God blesses you and pays the rent and the mortgage and the bills this month, but he will also. He will spread a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will also anoint your head with oil. He will also. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about Solomon and Solomon went to God and asked for wisdom and understanding to lead God's people. And God said, because you didn't ask for riches and wealth and money and fame, I will also. He will also. He's the God of also. He's a God of all so. He's a God of all so. He took you through it seven years ago. He will also take you through it again. He will. Because this is a simple matter. He will hand you over to the, the glory and the victory that he has in store for you because he's going to bring the enemy to fall right into your hands. So your lack of sight or your lack of vision cannot stop what Almighty God is going to do and will do. Because as we move into the last verse, after he said that, he said, you will ravage the country. You're going to knock out some people. You're going to level and flatten some enemies that have been bigging up their chest against you. You're going to go through and cut down trees and archards and everything that they built up to keep you out you're gonna label it you're gonna clog some springs you're gonna block their systems your prayer gonna stop some people in their tracks you're gonna litter their cultivated fields with stones you know what that is you're going to mess some people's dreams up. You're going to mess some people's prayers up. You're going to mess some people's bad minds up. You're going to mess up some people. Bad, bad, because you see, they thought that they could stop you, but they didn't recognize that Almighty God had given you a ticket because it's a simple matter for your God. You're going to mess up some dolly host enemy, some puppets, that are some poppy shows that have been around you. You're here to mess up every dream, everything they thought about you and wished for you. You come to mess it up. God say you're going to create a litter. You're going to mar some things. You're going to trample and crush and mash down and knock down and level some stuff. Because this is the victory. But well, hear this in verse 20, in the morning, in the morning. Suddenly, suddenly the water arrived in the morning. Water pouring from the west from Edom, flash flood filling the valley with water. It is a simple matter. Even when you can't see it, he's working. Even when you can't hear it, he's working because his hands are not short, neither are his ears top that he cannot hear you. He will also. So when you've chosen the way into a place that is your own mess, or maybe you followed others into that mess, it's the way. No wonder Job said it. Job said he knows the way that I take. He knows the way that I take, the one I chose 
the path I messed up myself in, the one I chose myself. He knows the way that I take. So when he's done with me, I will come forth as pure gold, as water running over. My cup is full and running over. There was a suddenly. In the morning, there is a suddenly. There is a suddenly coming to some people's watershed. There is a suddenly coming to some dark ditches around you. Dig up some ditches. Make room for what God Almighty is about to do in you because there are some, some suddenly moments that God's going to bring to you. You won't hear the wind. You won't see the rain. But there's a suddenly that's coming in your morning for weeping endures for a night. But joy. Your joy, your joy, your joy comes in the morning. Jeremiah wrote it, he said, new every morning. Every morning, his mercies are new. New every morning is the mercy of Almighty God, and he brings it fresh and overflowing. There was a flash flood. Flash flood warning. Many of us are from hurricane um, climates back in the Caribbean. Uh, we know what that is like. Flash flood warnings. We know when there is something coming in your valley ready to be filled up by Almighty God because he will also. You think he's only done with you 10 years ago or the last five years or the last three. He's a God of also. He will also. So you might have chosen a way that looped your detour into something that got you tangled. But there's a way out. Isn't there a man, a prophet among us? And not every prophet was a good and right prophet. Because when Jehoshaphat heard who the prophet was, the king of Judah said, there is a godly man that we can trust. So there are many prophets around you. And many people will have a word for you. Be careful of the one bringing the words to you. You need to know who you can trust because your way out of this is important. To consult God. Consult God. And despite how angering and upsetting some of those people have made you, you can still serve people that anger and upset you. Because your service to Almighty God takes precedence over your feelings for man. And so as they found the way out, then Elisha led them into worship with the musician to lead them into the atmosphere of God's presence, right where you are tonight. Whether you're up against the king of Moab or you're up against the entire tribe of Moab, I don't know what you're up against. I don't know how many people you are up against, but hear me tonight, somebody. Whatever is the way that you take, the Lord has a way out for you. And when you find yourself in a place of worship before Almighty God, he leads you, he leads you. And even if he's leading you in the valley, he will restore your soul. Yea, though he will walk before you, beside you, behind you, above you, beneath you, he will be within you and refresh you. He will build a fence about you. He will protect and keep you. He will send ministering angels around you. He will send people who will be the answer to the very thing that you need. Isn't there a prophet here among us that can consult God? The Lord will not leave this world without a witness. And there is a prophet. There is a messenger. There is a word from Almighty God. There is someone that he will bring to you to lead you that you can consult. You're not carrying this alone. You're not carrying this burden alone. He will lead you. And even when you can't hear it or see it, it doesn't mean that it stops the work of Almighty God, for he's doing something big and amazing in you. So right where you are, will you bow your heads, your heart, your spirit, everything that you are. Father, we come to you presenting a way before you, thanking you tonight for your word. For it defines to us that many times we have chosen our own path, our own ways, 
ways of destruction, ways of drought and wildernesses and valleys and badlands, ways, God Almighty, that are looped detours and roundabouts. And Lord, we're not, we're moving, but we're going nowhere fast. Lord, we are stuck in the loop sometimes and we become frustrated and it's angering and we spiral. We spiral into the anger, we spiral into shame, we spiral into blame game, we blame everything and everyone around us. Oh God Almighty, we spiral into negativity. What an example that was so clear in your word tonight. But only if we pause for a moment like your servant Jehoshaphat, who said, wait up, wait. Isn't there a prophet? Isn't there someone? Thank you, Lord, that in the wait, your word says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And you brought a word. You brought help in their time of need, in their distress. Thank you for the revelation. In just wondering a bit, isn't there a prophet? That sometimes, Lord, we need to just stop and wonder a bit. Lord, what would you have us do in this valley? Is there anyone you want to lead me to, Lord? Is there a place you want to lead me to? Is there a door that you, you want to lead me to that you will open so I can hear and consult with you and know the way? In the wondering, in the wondering, Lord, you gave clarity and you brought help. Oh, God Almighty, many times, Lord, even the thing you want to do in us, it's deterred by our own feelings. We carry so much resentment and bitterness. We are triggered. Oh, God Almighty. And sometimes, Lord, these people like, like, like Joram are triggering. They are angering. They have hurt and, and they bring disdain. And God Almighty, it is hard sometimes to be around them. It is tiring, distasteful even sometimes to find ourselves in the presence of those people who rip us apart and shred us down to nothing, make us lose our self-worth and esteem and, and make us feel like our whole life and worth is under our feet. People like the Jorahs. But what an example in your prophet, in your servant, that our service is to you, almighty God, and that our feelings should not get in the way of the work that you've called us to do. We recognize this is not a job. This is not a job. This is the work. Our work is to do the master's will. Oh, work is that what you've called us to do. May we not cause our feelings or pains from the past, the hurt and heartaches, the disrespect, the disdain, the derogatory things told to us. May we not cause those things to get in the way of the work of Almighty God. before whom we stand and serve. Empty us tonight, Lord, and give us a fire within our hearts for a commitment to the work to which you've called us. For we're working for a crown, for the King of glory has given us a spiritual assignment like Elisha, Lord, help us, help us, help us to not be overcome by the distractions of people around us who trigger our feelings, but to stay focused on the one who's called us to this. We look to you tonight, Lord. In fact, we, we ask that you teach us how to move into your presence, your atmosphere of worship, because worship, Worship opens doors to the move of God.
Worship brings the power of God in the room. Worship brings the answer of God in the space. Worship brings and calls down from heaven the suddenly of the gushing of the overflow of Almighty God. Teach us how to remain steadfast in worship despite the, war, the wars and the worries and the battles around us to stay steadfast in worship. For for you, this is a simple matter. It's nothing big. It's a nothing. It's a, it's a no brainer. It's an easy thing for you. Help us to always keep that focus, Lord. This is not about us. It is about you and your power and your might. So we thank you for breaking your word to our hearts tonight, Lord, as we receive of you and the transformation that you've wrought with your word in our hearts and the work that we will move from this place and space ready to do because we're challenged to be doers of your word. We bless you for hearing us and for the breakthroughs and the healings and the miracles and the understanding and the wisdom and the clarity and the knowledge that has come to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.